right, it's right at 6 o'clock, and I'd like to welcome everybody here today on this, the 20th of January of 2015, to our regular, regular meeting of the Blaine County School District Board of Trustees. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. We do have a quorum present. We have Trustee Schwartel, Trustee Graves, Trustee Baker is joining us via telephone, myself, Trustee Benyon. We have our superintendent, Dr. Gwen Carroll Holmes, here with us as well. And we'd like to welcome Asia Pettingale to, uh, as the student board representative to the board for the next few months. So welcome, and we appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, as a, just a sidebar, uh, Trustee Clayton will be joining us a little later. He's tied up with some other occupational needs at this current time. So he will be joining us. But if you would, please stand and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. And at this time, I'll go ahead and ask Ms. Coffin, are there any additions, corrections, modifications to the current agenda? There is one amendment to the uh, agenda, and it's a deletion. And farther on down in the agenda under decisions, uh, that's section 11, item C, courts addition and deletion recommendations. Uh, this uh, agenda item will be uh, moved off of tonight's agenda and will be part of the regular February 10th meeting. Do I hear a motion to accept the uh, amendment? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And Isha? Aye. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. The amendment has been changed, and that will be on the agenda for the February regular board meeting. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to an exciting portion of the evening for the accolades, and I'll turn the time over to Dr. Holmes. Thank you. We have three uh, staff members being recognized tonight, and the first one is Amanda Lachance, who I think I see sitting in the back row. If you'd please stand so everybody can recognize you. Amanda Lachance is one of those rare individuals that finds a special place in everyone's heart. As an administrative assistant to the Director of Student Services, she plays a major role in assisting special education teachers in understanding Medicaid rules and processes. Amanda has created training documents and provided guidance and instruction to teachers to help meet the specific details that a federal program such as Medicaid requires. And all of her efforts are done with a smile, a kind word, encouragement, and professionalism. She's a joy to work with and a wonderful member of our Blaine County School District family. So, Amanda, we're very glad to have you. Not only is your um, supervisor, Debbie Gutnick, happy to have you, but we're all very thrilled to have you as a part of us. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> she also spots rare owls if you're a birder and want to, <laughs> you need to be hooked up with her. Um, our second accolade tonight is for Nancy Durchi. There she is. She snuck in here. Uh, this says, Dear Dr. Holmes and Blaine County School Board, I'd like to request a board accolade for an employee that does an amazing job each day as she works at Cary School. As you know, on December 11th, Cary School had a light fixture in the lunchroom catch on fire. The plastic was burning and flaming as it dripped to the floor. I was on my way back to the school from a district leadership team meeting when it started. Howie called and told me he had gotten a call saying there was a fire alarm pulled at Cary School. I called Nancy, elementary secretary, and asked if we really had a fire. And she said, yes, there's a fire in the kitchen. When the kitchen staff came to the office to report the fire, Nancy pulled the fire alarm to evacuate the building and dispatch the fire trucks. She asked the kitchen staff if they could put it out with the fire extinguisher. I tried to call her back a minute later. When she answered, I realized she had it all under control and I should hang up and stay out of the way and let her take care of it. <laughs> when I returned to school, the students were back in their classrooms, everyone was safe, and everything was taken care of. 
I attribute that to Nancy being able to think calmly in a highly stressful situation, decide on the best course of action, and then follow through with that action. She was calm and helped everyone else stay calm. The other piece of the puzzle is that 100% of our elementary teachers were in Haley at a district training. Most of the students and guest teachers didn't know that we had an actual fire. They thought it was a drill. It is reassuring to know that we have people like Nancy working in our schools. She continues to do an amazing job. She is a true professional who is a wonderful first impression to anyone coming into our school. She's a shining star who is calm and caring every day. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, thank you, Nancy, very much. And I do have to agree that you are extremely welcoming. Carrie was the very first school that I visited here in Blaine County, and she welcomed me quite warmly. And our third accolade tonight is for Jim Chatterton. There you are. I was going to say, I saw you earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, this letter was actually written to him, but they um, copied me on it, so I snagged it. It says, Dear Jim, we of the Residential Construction Academy at Wood River High School would like to offer our sincere thanks for your time, effort, and expertise in training us on using a pipe threader. Not only did we learn how to measure, cut, burr, and thread pipe accurately and to industry standards, we also ended up with pipes suitable for attaching our newly purchased pipe clamp systems to. We understand how valuable your time is and appreciate you making yourself available to train us during your busy day. Thank you for being so patient. We really benefited from your knowledge and experience. Be sure to express our gratitude to Howie Royal for permitting you to work with us and to conduct the training at the maintenance facility. Your generosity and support is greatly appreciated. We have already put the clamps to good use. With them, we're learning real hands-on skills that can be used in the real world. Thanks again. Sincerely, the students of the Residential Construction Academy. Thank you, Jim, for all the work you do, not only helping keep our schools in good shape, but also helping our students learn real life skills. <clears throat> Thank you, is, is all we can say to, to those who received recognition and, and those who wrote the letters. We appreciate that, and it, it's exciting and, and good to hear some of the positive things that go on in our, in our district. So. With that, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Principal Dawn Hazley for our Hemingway Elementary School report. Good evening, members of the school board and members of the community. Um, tonight, I've been fortunate to bring some of our leaders from Hemingway Elementary School here to present to you a little bit about some of the programs that we have going on at Hemingway Elementary School. So I'm going to turn this over. First of all, I'd like to introduce we have Casimir Hogan, first grade. We have Jack Kendall, kindergarten. Taylor Rickson, fourth grade. Milo Banks, second grade. Lily Dean, fifth grade. And Trent Baker, third grade. So let me turn this over to Casimir and we'll get this show going.
snowshoeing on the fields around the school. Along the way, we take time to have fun, make friends, and build school spirit. But at the end of the day... <laughs> <laughs> we always keep the end in mind. We, we know we'll be ready for college or six Thank you very much. Does the school board have any questions from our students or myself? I'll open it up. <laughs> no, that was great. I'd just well, like you know, to say you guys are amazing, confident coming in here, I'm not even scared. You guys did a great job. Fabulous. Liz? I was just going to ask you just really quick, what is your favorite thing in school? Does anybody want to answer? Yep. Tech. Tech, okay. Um, I like skiing. Wow. And what, what is, what's your favorite sport? Um, I, I like to ride motorcycles. Good. That's great. Nice. And what is yours? <laughs> nice. Do you have any, any favorite? <laughs> okay. Yep. A lot of PE and a couple of I others. like science. Mm, that's great. That's great. And how about you? Good. That's great. And one more. Um, music. That's great. Nice. A lot of different answers. Thank you very much. Thank you guys very much for coming out tonight. I am very proud of the job that you guys did. Thank you. Amazing job. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for bringing it down.
I know. I know. I know. Very impressive. All right. There's a few people are filtering out. We'll go ahead and move on to the public comment portion of our meeting. And as of right now, I have one. Lori, has there been any more public comments that have come in? I didn't receive any. Okay. With that, I'd ask Mr. Pat Murphy if he wouldn't mind coming to the table and, and using the microphone for the, so the folks at home sure. could can hear you. Thank you. by the legislature has crippled the ability of charter schools to thrive. It appears that lack of foresight by the board of the Syringa Mountain School is the real problem. The board knew before they opened that Idaho law does not allow funding from local property tax assessments for charter schools. However, they still chose to open their doors without an adequate funding source. Now comes the request for the Blaine County School District monies to fund the charter school. The Waldorf methodology, methodology emphasizes experimental learning and minimizes and minimization of technology. We live in a technological world and mainstream education must address those needs. Some might say that the school district's current funding is barely adequate to maintain the high quality educational standards we expect. Occasionally, the district even requires major infusions in the form of levies. While I sympathize with families who may have been misled about the financial viability of this Ring Mountain School, we must not shortchange our mainstream schools by diverting property taxes to an experimental school. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for coming and making your public comment. And since we haven't received any more, out of courtesy, we'll go ahead and open it up to anyone else who would like to come in and make a comment at this time. All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on with our superintendent report. But before I forget, uh, Mr. Murphy, if you wouldn't mind, just make sure uh, our board clerk, Ms. Kaufman, has a copy of that letter for the minutes as well, please. Thank you very much. With that, Dr. Holmes. Okay, this evening I'd like to report on our strategic planning uh, process and where we are in that. As you are all, everyone is aware, or all the trustees are aware, since you attended last Thursday night, we had Daniel Pink with us to help kick that off and help us start thinking about the future that our children will be facing. And by the best count we can muster, it appears we had 476 participants that night. Uh, we had 419 in the theater, 15 elsewhere in the community campus, 30 at the community library, and 15 participating from Cary. So that was a nice, good start. Um, today we had four meetings take place across the, or across the schools for staff to participate in as the first part of the uh, strategic planning. We have six scheduled for tomorrow, including one in the evening at Cary School. So if you live out in the Cary area, please participate tomorrow starting at 5.30 at Cary. It's a drop-in meeting, so 5.30 to 8, any time out of Cary you could participate. And then three on Thursday, uh, one of them is at noon at the Y in Ketchum, and one of them is at 6 at the community campus where there's also child care and Spanish translation available. So we're off and running. Excellent. Thank you very much um, for your assistance in bringing in Mr. Daniel Pink. And I felt it was a, an excellent evening, very thought provocative evening. And um, it was enjoyable afterwards to sit and listen to him converse with some of the members from the Blaine County Ed, Ed Foundation and uh, learn from them as well. So thank you and appreciate the update. We'll go ahead now under the board chair report and turn the time over to 
our student board representative, Asia Pettingale, to see what's going on in the schools. Just make sure you've got the green light on and good to go. Okay, I can say between Wood River, Cary, and Silver Creek that we're um, getting back on track from a long and well-needed Christmas break. <laughs> <laughs> Um, their senior project presentations are done as of January 16th, um, preparing for their winter formal. Um, they had senior project ex exhibition before winter break. Um, boys and girls basketball is in full swing. Um, Cary High School, boys and girls basketball is also in full swing. Um, before Christmas break, student council delivered food baskets to families struggling in our community. National Honor Society delivered teacher appreciation candy bags to all high school teachers. Seven Habits Prep and Teaching was going on and has continued to go on. Student Teaching, student, the Seven Habits was broadcasted um, on KMBT before the break um, at our school. We almost reached midterms in second trimester. We reached those as of last Friday, I believe. And senior government presentations are coming up and we've had to choose a topic on a current world issue um, or US issue. Uh, Silver Creek High School is volunteering with Higher Ground to help with the Special Olympics. They had volunteers working at Rotorum and starting an art program. Chess team has also competed in the USCF Blitz Tournament that happened in Boise. And the LPIs have been going well with those who are out doing their internships and are, con and are continuing to set up other students with internships. And that is all. Excellent. Thank you very much for that report. And board, is there any questions? I'm curious, so you have a, uh, Carrie has a government presentation. Does Carrie have the senior projects as well, or is this we something have, similar? This is a thing that or something. Um, I believe our government teacher says that he's been doing this the past 14 years since he's been mm -hmm. um, We do have separate senior projects that happen um, over the summer and last try, I believe, but they oh. aren't currently happening. Mm -hmm. So that's done. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. done. But this is a separate presentation that's about as long as the senior um, project presentation. Does that go in front of the community or parents, um, or is it just know, for the classrooms? It's just in front of the class, yeah. but um, I'm sure um, maybe a couple teachers or um, our principal might come and watch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. One thing I'll point out too is I think it's a, a great opportunity for our upper grade students to go in and, and visit the, the younger grades and teach the seven habits. Um, that's, that's pretty neat to watch and, and to see and, and to hear my kids explain what they learned and I'm excited to look up to their role models. So, thank you. I just wanted to thank the students for helping out with Daniel Pink. There were presents everywhere. Mm -hmm. It was really great. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. With that, uh, we'll go ahead and move into the Daniel Pink presentation. And uh, we touched on it earlier. Um, Dr. Holmes mentioned how many people were there. And it was just a a great evening full of energy, full of excitement to listen, to make you stop and think about where our future is going, what our kids really need to learn, how are we going to be able to open their minds and have the desire to, to learn and to grow. Um, one of the most fascinating things I, I came away with that evening was probably the 90-10 uh, the or the, the Friday afternoon innovation opportunities. The FedEx days, only they can't call them FedEx days anymore. But uh, where even some of the, the businesses stepped aside for their, from their normal tasks and they found that they figured out that they hire professionals, they hired intelligent people, give them the time, let their minds be creative and, and open. And uh, a lot of times, um, in fact, one of the times that's where the, the Nobel Prize in Physics came out of is one of those little Friday afternoon sessions where you're not doing what you're structured to do, but you have that creative opportunity. And be able to teach our kids how to use that creativity and that innovation in their lives is really going to help them out in the, in the workforce of the future, I think. So, is there any other comments from, from the rest of the board who, who attended?
Well, I would agree with Sean. I think it was a great kickoff to the strategic plan because I think it just set the stage for us all opening our minds to a new strategic plan and looking at things differently. I've also had many uh, acquaintances who attended Daniel Pink, and it was very well received by the community. And I think there were, you know, for me as well as a lot of people attended, there were a lot of good take-homes, which I always think is a good sign of, you know, going to a talk. Excellent. So thank you, Gwen Carroll, for, yeah, for, Gwen for Carroll bringing him here. Yeah I, yeah, I wanted to say that was just an amazing kickoff, really. Sure. It was because it, the other thing was that I was just thinking as, John, as Sean was talking, it applied to everybody. It applied to students. It applied to administrators. It applied to teachers. It applied to everybody in this community. Shake it up a little bit. Go and have some time where you're not structured. And all of a sudden, you start to make those connections that create innovation and breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. so. Dr. Holmes. If, I, if I could just add to that, um, I do think it was very well received. Um, grocery shopping yesterday at Albertsons reinforced that for me. <laughs> <laughs> as there were lots of comments in the aisles as, as I was going along. Um, but I do want to um, recognize that it was a, a staff effort to, to bring him. It wasn't just me. There were many, many people that worked on this, students even that helped with it. Um, we raised the funds um, from uh, the foundation and from private individuals in the community, so it was at no cost to the school district. So it really was a community-wide effort. And so I just want to commend everyone for that. And then I do have to give a shout out to, um, you'll see this in um, February when we bring the course changes back to you. But one of the teachers immediately took it to heart and with in 24 hours, was writing a proposal for a new course, shot it off to oh me, um, you know, um, and has a, a great idea for a new course next year that gives kids um, s some opportunities to practice the three things that Daniel Pink was talking about, the autonomy, the mastery, and the purpose. And so uh, it's, it's already starting to bear fruit. So. Excellent, excellent. And thank you to the district office staff who helped decorate the, the auditorium. Mm -hmm. at was amazing. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I have some news. Call it exciting if you want. <laughs> um, upcoming this next year, there are three of our current board members who are up for election or re-election um, if they choose to. <clears throat> the board will pass a resolution calling for annual trustee election at our regular February 10th board meeting. Elections will be held on May 19th for candidates running for four-year terms in the trustee zone of one, three, and five, which just happened to be myself, Trustee Graves, and Trustee Schwartel. <laughs> so. um, for a timeline for everyone who's interested, um, declaration of candidacy along with a petition of candidacy must be filed by a qualified elector of the zone who is a United States citizen for at least 30 days preceding the day of the election, a resident and registered voter in the zone, and 18 years of age or older, by 5 p.m. on Friday, March 20th, to be considered as a candidate for the May 19th ballot. This also applies to the current trustees that wish to run for an additional four-year term. So, Pardon my tardiness? No problem. We appreciate you being here. So, but. So with that, basically the takeaway is May 19th is the election day and declarations of candidacy have to be in by March 20th for those of us who are going to run again or those members of, of zones one, three, and five once again who wish to put in for the election for the school board trustee position. So. Board members that want to come and get them for me, I'll have, uh, I'm going to be using the templates that uh, Iowa School Board uses. But um, to get a hold of me, I will get those to you. Anybody that's interested in getting those stuff that one back. Yep, and, and they return to me, they so then I give it to the council. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Note um, moves us on to our item D. And just a reminder to the remainder of the, the board. After our regular board meeting this, this after or this evening, 
Um, we will be fulfilling our contractual obligations <laughs> <laughs> with Dr. Holmes and we'll be um, working on our um, mid-year superintendent evaluation. So we're excited to have Dr. Holmes here with us and to fulfill our what we promised each other that we would do when she was hired. So we're pleased and we're moving forward with that. As far as announcements, um, Dr. Holmes hit on some of these. The next couple of days are very important for the strategic plan, um, for the, excuse me, strategic planning process. We have our community meetings down in Cary tomorrow, January 21st, 5.30 to 8.30 as a drop-in during the student-led conferences in Cary. Then Thursday, we have, on the 22nd, we have a meeting from 12 to 1 at the Ketchum YMCA, and Thursday, January 22nd, from 6 to 7.30 at the community campus in Haley. And as noted, the meeting at the community campus in Haley, there will be Spanish translation as well as childcare provided. And we'd really like to encourage people to come out to these meetings. The, the big ideas that we're gonna be garnering um, in these brainstorming sessions are really what's gonna be guiding our strategic planning process. Those members of us who are on the, the strategic planning steering committee we're going to be analyzing the ideas that come from these meetings. The ideas aren't going to be our own. All the ideas are going to be coming from, from these meetings, so it's, it's crucial that uh, the members of the public come out and, and, and share what's important to them to see, say what, what, the, what the big picture of education is in their mind. So we strongly encourage everyone to come. Also, uh, Thursday on the January 22nd at 4 p.m. It's community campus in the mini more room. We have our policy committee meeting. Our wellness committee meeting will be January 26th at 4 here in this boardroom, as well as our financial committee meeting on January 27th at 4 here in this boardroom. And then our regularly scheduled uh, board meeting is February 10th. And we'll once again be back here in, the, in this board, boardroom for that. With that, I believe that concludes all the announcements and everything in the board chair report, unless there's anything else that the board would like to bring up at this time. All right, we'll go ahead and move forward with the agenda under business, and we'll turn the time over to Mr. Mike Chatterton and Mike Beck, the financial committee chairman for recommendations. several months now, the first thing that they took a look at was uh, the insurance, the current insurance program that we have that we offer to all of our employees for uh, health insurance. And the recommendation that the finance committee is bringing forward to the board is to look at uh, what other options are there out there. What we'd like to do is take a look and, uh, and determine whether or not we want to change insurance companies if we want to uh, look at other options that we have as far as insurance company needs for all of our employees. doesn't mean we're going to change uh, companies. It just means we're going to get proposals from other insurance companies. In, in that process as well, which will be coming up a little bit later in the evening, is to actually formally bid for insurance uh, brokers' services. And uh, what we did find out through this uh, process was that currently we're paying about one and a half percent for insurance with our current insurance broker of the annual premium. And talking with the insurance broker that we had prior that came and gave us our presentation about two months ago, it, it was it was determined that we would we could probably save about twenty to twenty five thousand dollars a year by looking at different options on different brokerage services. So That'll be another thing that we'll look at doing here shortly too. But what we'll do is we'll get uh, requests for prices from three different insurance companies in Idaho. And then uh, we'll look at those <coughs> insurance companies, we'll compare them with our current policy that we have in place now, 
and determine whether or not we'll make a move with the insurance company. If not, we'll stay with the insur same insurance company that we have right now. All right. <coughs> Any questions, comments from the board? Yeah, I do. I read through this, and I just want to be clear. So we're going to ask, or what the recommendation is, is to go get three bids on new insurance plans, right? Is that right? There's really only three insurance companies in Idaho that can give us bids. That can give us bids. Yes. So we're going to ask for three bids. Yes. And so where does the insurance broker come in? So we currently have an insurance broker, and what does that person do? That insurance broker, he's the one that negotiates increases on behalf of the district. He looks through the policy, compares the policies. He'll actually prepare all of the requests for uh, proposals from the, the three different insurance companies. But he, he's the one that negotiates the, the premiums between the school district and the insurance companies themselves. So this would, so, the in, so we get three bids and we, we go with the lowest bid, probably. Well, who knows? We go with a bid and then the insurance broker comes in after that? No, the insurance broker will actually be part of the process of getting the requests for pricing for the three insurance companies. He'll be the person that, that writes up the request for pricing and, uh, and submits it to the insurance companies. And then the insurance companies will respond. We'll get a committee together of school district employees to determine which insurance company we want to go to or to stay with the same company that we have currently. So that insurance broker helps with that whole process, the whole bid process and whatnot. So we currently have an insurance broker mm -hmm. that we've already paid yes. 1%. And then we have another discussion about possibly getting a new insurance broker. So wouldn't we use that insurance broker since we've already paid? We, w them? we will use this insurance company broker that we have right now. Uh -huh. The only thing we're going to do is look at uh, to make sure that we're getting a fair price for the services that he's providing to us. If I could add on, the insurance broker, besides helping us find the insurance company, I don't know if Mr. Blackman wants to talk to what the insurance broker does well, on it. Right. He's an independent broker, so he will go out and get quotes from different companies because he doesn't represent one company. Right. And then, and then after we pick a company, then we can pick a broker if we choose not to use this broker in the future. The, but the thinking is we're, we have to have an insurance broker yep. or we have to have another position that manages this work on a day-to-day -day yep. basis for our employees. Yep. So it's one of the six, one half dozen yep. of the other. Um, the thinking, though, is right now is if we're going to look at the possibility of new insurance, it is also the time to look at the possibility of getting a better deal for a broker. It could be we end up with the same broker. But if we're going to rebid insurance, we need to also make sure that the broker that is working with us is giving us the most competitive rate possible as well. Okay. So. And there's Mr. You know, Beck. It seems like an extra <laughs> layer. I yeah, agree. I, I, I was thinking mm -hmm. that there was what I was envisioning was was crossover with brokers. Mm -hmm. There is a little like bit a little of like a little double. You know, that's what I was because the broker who's under contract right now would finish this year as far as any uh, employee uh -huh. claims, any of that kind of navigation that we need yeah. as far as running it. The new broker, if it is a new broker, it right, would be the right, same right. one. Would be the one that would help us bid going forward. So when does the contract of our broker right now end? June 30, correct? June 3rd? 30. 30. 30. June, end June of the year, 30th. Fiscal year. End of the fiscal year, yeah. And then when would we put out the RFP for a new broker? And that, so then that broker would start off after June 3rd? I think that timeline was... Yeah, the, they would overlap. They're, you're right. There is some overlapping because they would help us begin the bidding process for insurance for next okay. year, which we have to do now. It could be the same person. There right. could be but, no overlap at all. But maybe a new broker might say, I'll do it for half percent of your... 
Correct. Okay. okay. And then okay. that could save us money in the long run. Okay. Thank you. I, mm -hmm. I understand that, it. That would be the reason to, to bid for services like that, is to see if you can get a better deal with somebody else for the same type of services. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments from the board? Do we need anything to add directly? <laughs> 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 well, I just, you have our memo. It's on the board. Okay. Uh, any questions about the process or conclusions or recommendations? Um, well, it seems to make sense if we can save some money by bidding out and getting, you know, getting some different bids and possibly saving some money by healthcare costs, getting a new broker and to sort of get a handle on our healthcare costs right. that are rising. One of the main thing, main things that came out of the meeting, which came out in in um, Boise also when we went into that workshop, I can't remember if you were there, but there's a, a possible law change here, whereby Blue Cross Blue Shield will have a self-insured program, which it sounds like it's basically semantics, where they're going to <laughs> allow. Really, it does. Um, I mean, that's my opinion. Where they, if you if you say you're self-insured, then all of a sudden you save. Um, four and a half percent approximately in fees and taxes. So that's right coming up. So this year is kind of a, a twilight zone in terms of um, it seems like that's going to be a very popular option. And so we really didn't have a decision to make about that because it's in process. Yeah. Whether the district stays in the Idaho pool or not, complex mm -hmm. uh, analysis and then decision to be made. Uh, but uh, as we have stressed though in that in the, in the memo, the, the, the big drawback to stay in the Idaho pool is the lack of visibility and the lack of ability to get specific claims experience for the district. We can't get that in the Idaho pool. And I Historically. Of being in the pool. Being in the yeah. Pool. Okay. One of the factors that we determined was being in the pool, you're basically getting the same rate as everybody else in the pool. You're getting the same percentage increase as everybody else. And we don't have any way of taking our experience or rating what's, what's been happened to the employees of Blaine County School District over the past five years and actually negotiating with those individual insurance companies because it's based on the entire pool instead of just our specific right. pool. By going out with another insurance company outside of the pool, we have all of that insurance information about what's actually going on with our own individual staff members. Where with inside the pool, we don't have that information. So there will be, be a lot of decisions that will still have to be made once we get the actual pricing from the insurance companies of whether or not we want to go outside of the pool or we want to stay inside mm -hmm. of the pool. And then mm -hmm. that'll be, a lot of it will be depending on what the price of the insurance coverage is. Mm -hmm. Well, I really want to thank the financial committee and all, you know, every staff community members that were in that because this was a big, it's a big thing, undertaking. a big thing to tackle. And I sat in on a couple of the meetings and I know everybody was, you know, very much attention to detail and I thank you for putting in your time. I appreciate that. All right. And that also leads us directly into our next topic as far as financial committee topics. And uh, Mr. Beck, if before you sneak out, oh. if, if I can <laughs> ask you a question. Um, we need you. <laughs> when, when we first uh, organized the financial committee, we, we tasked you with the opportunity to look at the health insurance as well as to begin looking into a um, classified salary structure um, and we just got a report on the recommendations for the health care uh, wondering are you do you guys have sufficient to do would you like more to tackle <laughs> to look at at this current time if you don't mind please I don't know. I 
thing. How do I get back to my... Uh, the end of the last meeting, uh, December meeting, uh, Mike Chatterton gave us oh, back. You, you have to hold it to get recorded, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Mike Chatterton gave us some background information to try to bring us up to speed on, 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 on that issue. My concern as I've looked at that is the level of detail for us to really get in there and fill in the blanks on a classified salary schedule is, I don't know if it's, I think it's way above our pay grade, <laughs> to be honest with you, the more okay. I've looked at that information. Uh, so that's where we are with that. I don't know how much time we can productively spend trying to fill out that, you know, develop a pay scale for that, okay. for that class of employees. So it might be more beneficial to have staff come up with that pay scale, bring it into you, have you guys take a look at it, give your comments, and then send it back to us, basically. Yeah, we would be, yeah, be happy to review it from okay. our, you know, what I call a 10,000 foot level, mm -hmm. uh, if you will, versus starting to get into the weeds and really drill down and understand employee jobs, job description, mm -hmm. all that. I mean, that's just, I think that's just my uh, okay. concern about that. Okay. With that, then I'm hearing that you're ready for more topics to tackle. <laughs> So That's what we're here for. <laughs> okay, we appreciate your, your service. And I'll go ahead and open up to the, the board for any discussion on, on possible topics that they might be look, um, inclined to assist us. Sure. Well, I, I'm the, um, the board representative, liaison, whatever, on this committee. And it's a board standing committee. And the way I see this is it's not a staff committee, it's a board committee, meaning that board and staff are complementary, they work together. but. The board needs information from, like you said, the 30,000 foot view. And so if we look at, if we can look at the big picture, where are our big buckets of money being spent? Teachers, salaries and benefits, um, non-teaching staff salary and benefits, so that would be classified, um, uh, supplies, capital, those big buckets. And then, and then if we have questions, then we can ask staff for, for example, we say, you know, I'm just putting it out there, okay, our supplies are, are seem to be out of line compared to other districts, compared to what seems reasonable, whatever our, met, you know, our way of looking at it is chosen to be. We then go to staff and ask for more information depending on what we think we need. The other part that's needed, I think, is before we even get to that, is, a, is an overview for this committee. A couple of people have come up to me and said, we really don't understand the big picture of, of, of the school finances. So I think that we need that part too. We kind of jumped into the healthcare um, piece. So those would be my, um, my, that would be my recommendation is, I don't know how you feel. Well, yeah, I, I was looking at the, uh, and I'm not sure that it's the document that was produced by the the district uh, mm -hmm. on the financial committee. It's the financial committee roles and responsibilities and then goes on the composition and criteria for committee members, etc. And I was reviewing that um, recently, but especially the roles and responsibilities. And when you look at the, the first section of that of this document, um, you know, the financial committee is designed to act as a committee to the board regarding the financial interests and operations of the system fulfilling oversight responsibilities. And then there's seven bullet points, and they're pretty high-level stuff. Uh, assist the district, district in educating general public concerning and the general public, and educating the general public concerning school finance issues, annual budget review. Um, so look, it, it is a very, I guess, looking at that, and, and we've had some discussion at the committee level about what is our role, where are we, are we down, you know, 10,000 foot, or are we down there? So, I, and I was going to. There's questions among the committee members. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just about how, I mean, uh, how often do we want to meet? The issues we want to tackle, and what, how we fill, fill this role mm -hmm. to the most benefit of our time and to the district. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you know, maybe um, a good place to start, because 
uh, Liz was mentioning how you know everybody sort of jumped right into you know the health care issue and working on the benefits which we're very grateful but to take a little bit of a step back and get more information or have some sort of meeting or workshop about just district finances in general and maybe that's something that you know Mike and Mike and Liz can put together or something for the group a, a little 101 type of finance um, workshop for the financial committee there was some I don't know at it back in September at our initial meeting right and I know it was you know, oh, you know, you could go in and have meetings, but maybe it should be for, for everyone, and maybe that would lead into some of that educating of the, the public, or making a, you know, a, a, a budget that mm -hmm. maybe, you know, is easier read. I don't know. Uh, that's to me. That's one of the topics that I would like to, especially as we're coming up on the the budgeting time of year. Yeah. Um, that I find critical is. Is before I got on the board, I didn't understand school finance whatsoever. Now that I'm on the board, <laughs> I, I know this much. I hope I have a little better grasp, but um, obviously I'm not, I'm not a professional. And I think being able to take a budget that's presented to the board and being able to break it out into um, a reader-friendly document that's easy, more easily understood, I think could be very beneficial to us as a board as well as to the members of our pu public as well. So to me that, that's the direction that I would, I would like to see the um, financial committee go is, is assisting us as it comes into budgeting time of year into uh, making that a more user friendly document. Yeah. Well and I know that that's, it's always been an interest especially of Sean but the rest of the board to have a, um, a data dashboard. So that would fit in with that goal too. So yeah would kind of dual purpose to educate you and help you help educate everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think last year Mike did a great job. You know, we had lots of meetings that educated us. I mean, I have a better understanding of how that budget's put mm -hmm. together, but we didn't see lots of public right. here. <laughs> those just meetings. too much. I've been an accountant for 30 years. <laughs> right, but 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 maybe yeah. that would you know be a good thing to have different community members sure. give input on, but have that workshop that's put together maybe by you guys for the financial committee. Maybe not by the next meeting, maybe mm -hmm. by the next meeting. Not, I don't know. So that would be my. Input. Can we come up maybe with a, a group decision about this to 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 ask the the committee to. To give them a direction. Yeah, so it's clear. I'm good with that. Trustee Clayton, do you have a, anything to add to the conversation? What are you specifically asking for? I'm, I'm specifically asking for a mac, macro view on the, on the budget. And the four places that I'd really like to see peeled away are teachers' salaries and benefits, staff salaries and benefits, capital spending, and other spending, in other words, supplies and things like that. Those are the four things I want to know, but there may be things that I don't know that they that that the experts, the the accountants on there say actually we should be looking at as well. Um, and then the the ultimate purpose of this is not just to educate the committee, but to make that information accessible to the public in a way that's user friendly. So on that the expenditure side of the budget, you mean? But revenue actually revenue is everything. There's a revenue to yeah. it too. Yeah, right? everything. So. Yeah. So, because Can right now there's carry But on a more macro over. scale. You're yeah. talking about a macro scale. Yes. Like, let's punch it together. Because I, you know, as I read through my three hours last night, you know, I started looking at all the breakout of all the different schools and then all the different schools and then this level of, this level of staffing, this level of staffing, this level of staffing. It'd be, it'd be, it's a lot to add up, right? I mean, you can do it, but there's a lot to add up. There could be conceivably a more chunked out system. I see what exactly what you're saying. So, so we know, I mean, the ultimate goal here is to make wise decisions spending the money. So if we see we're spending way too much, and uh, like I was using the example, it's just an example. In the supplies category, we say, okay, can we shade that? Can we, and where do we, where's our priority? Is our priority over here on 
you know, on teachers and uh, salaries and benefits? Is it on support staff salary and benefits? Where is it? So that's where it helps me as a board member. That's why I feel that's the value added to me as a board member. And then there's also value added to the community. Kathy, I, I know you're, I hear you. <laughs> I'm wondering if you have any input. Yeah, I was just waiting for everybody else to speak. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I agree generally with what's been said so far. I think that that would be a, a good task for the Financial Advisory Committee. Uh, last year we did something significantly different with our budget presentation. I think analyzing the way we did it through that committee and looking at how that information would be presented in a um, more efficient, more clear way, both to the board and to the community, would be a very good task, as well as, um, you know, the education piece of that for that committee. Uh, I think after that is completed, which would be clearly several months from now, then we would look at, you know, what the next steps would be in conjunction, especially with the wrapping up of our strategic plan and how um, the spending would uh, match and enhance what we want to do with uh, the findings from that. So, yeah, I, I would agree that I think that the education piece and uh, developing a better presentation for the board of community would be a fantastic task for them to handle. Okay. Any thoughts, Dr. Holmes? I just want to clarify uh, what exactly we're being asked to do. We're asking to make a better presentation of the budget or I heard you use the term peel away and I wonder what 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 do you mean by peel away I, I, I don't think that well I shouldn't answer for you oh, no <laughs> no what I meant was okay so you get all when when you look at the budget you see all these various um, revenues and expenditures but really what you need to do is to there's those don't tell you the the four things I just wanted in part of it does and part of it doesn't and it's hard to find in my mind, mm -hmm. just is a simple, you know, as a simple a part. summary of all of that. She's looking exactly. for sums, right? Okay. Like we would be taking all of the so elementary schools summit. and their salary summit. Okay. Correct. Then Got do it. a sum here and a Correct. sum here, yes. and then it's quicker to look at and easier to see. The level of detail within what's presented to us is fantastic. I mean, and there's yeah. there's not a there's not a hair out of place. It's like every if you read the whole thing, it's all there. Like mm -hmm. I don't think it could be more transparently laid out than it is, but it's onerous. To go through it all, so it would be nice to have for lay people for sure, just the quick one-page view. Whoa, okay, wow, that's cool. And then for us to, you know, it, it could be there's a simplification to it. Yeah. It's summing. It okay. basically would be summing. Does that make and sense to maybe, you? Maybe, maybe yeah, an executive summary or yes. something where you put some narrative. Cost drivers and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cost mm -hmm. and put it yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and revenue side as well because uh, that was the. I, I, mm. I, I've got a concern, um, longer term concern, because our funding is very different from other school districts. So I, I want to see just exactly where, you know, how much of the budget is dependent on funding that is based on an exception made by the legislature and that we might have to think about longer term and what the committee's opinion is on ways that we might be able to long term look ahead. All right. Is that enough direction? You can. Oh, no. no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. We, like I said, we really appreciate your service and for helping us look into the health care coverage and look forward to, to see what you come up with, the summations, and, and helping us make that a more uh, reader-friendly document. So, so thank you very much. You're so with that, we will go ahead and move on to the foods or ask, uh, excuse me, don't let me get ahead of myself, student fees report and recommendations. Okay, you have in your packet the recommendation. Um, this was based on some work in the district leadership team meeting, so it involved principals. You also see a listing of what the fees were that were collected by our secondary schools last year. Um, the, we had a discussion about the policy because the policy uh, requires that no fees be levied for required courses and then goes on to talk about uh, paying fees for elective courses and we had a conversation about is there really such a thing anymore especially when you're required to have 22 elective credits is there such a thing as an optional course or um, 
should students be forced to take the elective credits that have no fees rather than the ones that have fees if that's the situation they fi their family finds themselves in. So our ultimate recommendation is that we would eliminate fees for all required and elective courses, whatever the difference are, is between those two. And then things such as yearbook, student activity uh, cards, those kinds of things we would continue to charge fees for. Um, but there is assistance for students if they need that and also for um, any dual credit, the tuition, the AP exams, those kinds of things, we would continue to charge for that. There is assistance both through the state of Idaho for that and from the can-do funds. And so um, that will make a little uh, minor impact on the budget for reallocating things for next year, but should be very easily handled in the budget process. So that's our recommendation. Trustee Graves. I just have a question. Why is does the Wood River Middle School have <laughs> such high fees? It's, it's over twice <laughs> the amount of the high school. Um, Mr. Peters is uh, on his way back to town right now, but Mr. Ditch is here. I don't know. I think the main thing that is the difference is the PE fees. Um, and PE, of course, is the class that's required. So um, we are going to do away with those fees. Uh, at the high school, they charge if you break the lock. At the middle school, they charge a locker rental fee up front. So we'll flip that around. If you break the lock, then you'll have to pay for it in the end. Um, we'll have PE shirts available, but you can also wear just a plain white T-shirt if you want to. So oh, that's a great idea. I have something to say. Go ahead, Trustee Baker. Okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Superintendent Holm. I had spoken to her on a couple of occasions about really wanting to have this investigated and presented to the board to understand why we were doing this. And I appreciate the thoroughness of the report and, um, you know, wholeheartedly agree with her recommendations as far as um, discontinuing the practice of taking these fees. So thank you for um, being prompt and thorough in your presentation. Well, thanks to the administrators, too, for understanding the situation. Mm -hmm. I, I would tend to agree that uh, if, the, if they're looking for directions for the budgeting time of year, that I would agree with the recommendations as well to do away with the fees. Um, we are extremely fortunate in our school district to be in a financial position where we are. Um, we don't want to jeopardize that, but I think that um, in the collection of some of our fees, um, can take a, a toll on some of our, our, on our students and, and their families. So I'm, I'm in full support of, of having the, the fees taken care of in another way throughout the budgeting process. Just, just one question. It says it is anticipated that this so will be short about twenty one. That we'll have to reallocate twenty one thousand. Uh, so that will come from the supplemental materials and or software accounts. Uh, what's the supplemental materials? Are, are those out of the, the district supplemental yes. materials or yes. high school? Or yes. Um, there are, right now, there are core materials that are adopted by the district that we use for teaching uh, the Idaho core standards, uh, including uh, intervention programs that are, and then there's also supplemental programs <laughs> that can be used in addition to and we'll just reduce some of those supplementals to be able to okay. compensate. So we for shouldn't that. feel a, anything in our budget. No. And then, are we going to be voting on this? Do we need to vote on this, or do we just give no, guidance? No, this is another one. Again, one of these budget <coughs> where we're <coughs> sticking our finger out and seeing which way the wind's going. So okay. as we're building the budget, okay. we're building it with your. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I would agree with your recommendation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think Mike had his hand up before. I don't know if you had anything else to add. I was just going to explain a little bit more about where those fees come from from the middle school. Oh, okay. Yeah. The uh, actually, there's it's the majority of the money's coming from the middle school would be from three separate accounts. They charge their students uh, arts and crafts mm -hmm. textile fee. Mm -hmm. They also charge their uh, a PE and health fee that Dr. Holmes was talking about, and they also charge their students a technology class fee. And between those three is 90% of the money that's coming in from those fees. Okay. Thank you for looking okay. that up. 
Appreciate that. Is there any other comments from the board? All right. We will go ahead and move on to the food service feasibility study. Yeah, I think uh, we have people here that can speak to this much better than I can, other than the fact that um, we asked for this study based on the um, uh, interest uh, of improving uh, the food that we serve to our students um, to at least scratch cooking, if not more um, organic food as well. And uh, so this is another issue that uh, impacts the budget greatly, and we're just trying to get a read on it. So. Um, I don't know, Mr. Chatterton or you or any of the representatives from Chartwells want to speak to what's involved in this? We'd like to recognize and welcome John and Duane from Chartwells. We appreciate their, their, their the being here room. with us. <laughs> uh, I would probably defer all the questions to, to Mr. Moppin from Chartwells. Sounds good. Well, as a board, um, we've had a chance to, to look at it, and uh, I'll go ahead and open it up for a discussion or questions to Mr. John Maupin. I had, I had a question. So it's, I was under a different impression that in May, this, this memo says that the district worked with John Turin from March through May of 2010 um, to plan for implementing a uh, sustainable food program in the lunchroom. This transition was started at Hemingway and was impl implemented there for 2010-11 school year. The result of this transition was a drop in the number of school lunches served per day. That, that section makes me think that John Turin was hired by the district and that the sustainable foods program was not successful because of his input. And I don't know. That's and and I've and I've heard that that's not correct. So I just want clarification. No, John Terine was not hired by the school district. Okay. He was. He gave us a proposal, right. and the proposal that he provided the school board at that point in time was for a fee, and we could get the same services from Chartwells within our existing contract, and so the board at that point in time hired or just extended that contract service to Chartwells instead of John Terrain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the next question is what went wrong in the implementation? Because it didn't work. Something went wrong there. So I just wanted to know, you know, was it the implementation? What, from your point of view, it didn't last. It went down. This dro there was a drop in the number of student lunches. Correct. Um, we implemented a scratch cooking basis. There wasn't organic foods used at that time. It was primarily scratch cooking. Um, eliminated some of the more, at the previous years, popular items that were perceived to be less healthy and proceeded the whole year following that menu throughout the year. We had a very slight bump of literally just a handful of kids the first three to four months on a per month basis. Mm -hmm. And then starting about December, January, the count started going off. We started going down three, four, five kids in the paid category. The free and reduced categories were made steady the whole time through. There was never a change in that category. Um, Duane um, changed the menus, introduced new items, uh, reworked popular items to be more of a healthy choice. Right. Um, the fruits and vegetables were made available to the kids, which they had been prior on a salad bar type basis. Mm -hmm. um, trying to put forth a program that the district was looking and it was based, it wasn't based on, but it was very similar to what John Turin had spoken about. Um, we also went to, I think that year, um, looking at Bigwood Bread, I think that might have been the first year we used them. If not, it was, was that? That's right. That's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Bigwood um, Bread that year as well. We also used Idaho Bounty a little bit that year, I believe. Mm -hmm. We're trying to use some more local produce. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you exactly why it failed. I don't say. I can't say it failed. The counts came down slightly. It wasn't like it went from 400 kids to 200 kids. It went from roughly two, two and a quarter kids to 210 kids. Mm -hmm. oh, so, so it wasn't really. a huge number, mm -hmm. but it did decline as the year went on. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. 
um, so, so the, the, you know, I have a, I have a. I guess I, I would like the board to be able to, and I, I would actually like Chartwells too, to be able to open, open their mind to outside um, uh, consultants on school food in, in, in not so much even what exactly you're serving, but maybe the implementation piece, the education piece. They had a, you know, I mean, you know, they had a smashing success at, at um, St. Luke's. That's what the board member at the time called it, a smashing success. And I'm not, I think that you and Dwayne, I respect Dwayne like he's amazing. <laughs> um, and he does really a fantastic job with what he has. I think that there's a maybe a mindset difference that happens when it's not a corporation. I'm not exactly sure if I can put my finger on it. I just know that there's been other there's been success in the valley elsewhere, and I think it might be the implement, implementation piece. But I'm I'm a little bit concerned that if we if we go down the same road again, we're going to get the same result, which is I want to see a smashing success. So that's where I, you know, and I, and I know that John Turin wants to, wanted to, he had no intention whatsoever. As a matter of fact, that's part of his proposal is to um, work closely with the, with the corporate food providers. As a matter of fact, he used to be one. So I, I just would like to think, you know, open our minds to that. I've heard that, you know, I've heard a substantial number of people want that. I know St. Luke's wanted to help us with that. Um, for years, and so I, that's that's a piece of this for me. I'm not at all denigrating what Chartwells does because you guys do a, a job that I think is within the what you have to work with is is what you know at the top of your game in terms of Idaho's bounty, getting them in every now and then, and trying to talk it up in the schools. I don't know why it doesn't quite work. Other thoughts from the board. Um. Thanks for elaborating. That's interesting about the going from two, because when I was thinking, I'd been told before that it didn't, you know, work up a Hemingway, but really 225 down to 210, yeah, it, that's it, really it. not, you know, a significant drop of, of kids, you know, going to that. Not, it wasn't an increase, but it wasn't a big significant drop. So um, I was just looking at all of the... Uh, the, the kitchen um, retrofits. retrofits exactly so I'm so at I'm just going to use Hemingway for an example because you were able to use that kitchen for a year of scratch cooking without making retrofits <laughs> so what, why the yeah 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 exactly what, what we looked at with this was yeah. Wayne's a chef, and I've got cooking experience in industrial or um, institutional sized kitchen. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we looked at from the high end, if you want the best ability to provide the best product for your students, this is the type of equipment I would want to have in place. Okay. There's a dramatic difference between blanching a vegetable to put it in a casserole and sauteing it to put it in a casserole. The flavor profile is dramatically different. Uh -huh. So we were looking at we can cook it with what you have now. We can do scratch cooking with what you have now. Mm -hmm. But to get the highest flavor, the best right. product, right. Um, to also move, when we did this, we were talking about moving to organics. None of that's processed, so we have to process that food. So as part of this equipment is cross food processors, right. stuff like that, to chop vegetables up and things like that. So that was the, this was the high end. If you wanted to get to the best possible meal, right. this is what we'd recommend to put in place. We can do it with a single oven. Just the flavor profile is going to be different than if you went to your local restaurant and when they're using burners and saute pans and everything else, there's a different flavor profile. Right. Okay. That's, so we could do it with what here or a portion of this. Some of the, some of the point we would need to move if we wanted to process our own vegetables in house. But the the high end um, dollar items there, the ovens and stuff, or the tilt skills and stuff like that, we could probably do without. It's just, it's going to be a different product. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I noticed that Hemingway needs a walk-in cooler. Do, do a lot of the other places have walk-ins? It's just the size. She doesn't have one. She's only a walk-in. That's the only school that doesn't have one. Right. Is Hemingway. Yeah. 
they're all mm. doing reach ins and if we go to doing our own vegetables and such, just we don't have the physical space to store the vegetables and things that we need to do. And if we're doing other depend on what menu we actually went mm. to, that it's just we just don't have the physical space to store it. Right. I have some other questions, but I'll have other people and <laughs> give them a chance. <laughs> Trustee Clayton, Trustee Baker. Yeah, I, I'm just curious about that. I think this is like a pretty significant initiative district-wide. And we have seven schools, right? Each of the seven schools <laughs> must be in various states of repair as far as their kitchens go, right? There doesn't seem to be any staging or like, oh, well, this is a bad one. Why don't we go with this one for, I, I have no idea which is where. But, you know, there's a pretty big now, that capital, it kind of seems to be, to a, do this. Uh, there's a capital cost involved. You know, this proposal is all in, right? Like, we do it or we don't do it. The initiative is great. I think the concept is great. I think that the nutrition is very important to all individuals, and it's very appropriate to the times and health, and we have the, the data and the knowledge to know what's good for people and what's bad for people, right? And obesity is an issue within the nation. I mean, it's, it's there. It's in your face, and it needs to be considered. So it's like, I'm just curious, like, this is a, I mean, when I look at it over two years, it's 80, 800,000 a year to pull this off in variance and deficit, right? It's 900 and something in the first and 600 and something in the second. Mm -hmm. 800 a year, 1.6 total, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? So do we just dive into that and say, hey, this is the panacea and do it? Or do we have a staging plan in place possibly to say, well, this is gonna, this kitchen needs upgrading anyways. Why don't we upgrade in that sense to this place? make this one better, take that into consideration for scratch cooking, do it, and I, I don't see that there, and that, I'm just asking that, that question. That would be a district of how you wanted to approach it. Just Some of this with equipment, if you decided where we might have, well, if you put it out to bid, just talking about bidding, if you did this at once and you bid it, you're going to get a better price than if we do one a year. Yeah. You're going to be different on the value of the equipment. This was just, they asked what would it cost to upgrade the kitchens mm -hmm. to the best possible kitchen to produce for your students, and that's what we put together. You could stay with this in any way you wanted to. We actually, I think I mentioned in there, the stag of the implementation of this. Dwayne, with his day job, has a lot on his plate right now to actually spend time and work with these cooks to get them to that next level. We would recommend having a culinarian or a chef or somebody that would actually spend time at each one of those schools on a regular basis, doing a month implementation one school at a time as far as the actual training. Kicking it over. Yeah, to and then from follow-up and stuff and um, development of recipes and so on after that. So it would be a team effort between him and Dwayne or her and Dwayne. Because going back to the smashing success aspect, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, you did have a little bit of a downtick, like, ooh, okay, mm -hmm. butter's butter, you know? If I put a little more butter in, it might taste better. It is like, <laughs> my, wife's, my, my wife's grandmother was a lunch lady back in our time, right? And uh, she could do magic with a pound of butter. <laughs> she made the best Baking American butter, do a lot of things, yeah. best American goulash I ever ate. She made, right? <laughs> but um, it's new times, right? And it's like this is significant investment. So it's like if it's not smashing success out of the gate, like how do we approach it? I, I mean, I'm of the mind that it should be approached incrementally, mm -hmm. and it should be okay. Well, this worked. This didn't work. This didn't. I mean, if you got it seven wide and it didn't work, okay, now I got to go seven wide, figure it out. Versus I'm in one. Pretty much everybody's palate's more or less the same. We all live in the same place. Like, you know what I'm saying. Is if it's working in one place, it's a pretty good chance it's going to work in another place. There's enough variety. There's 400 kids per school, basically, and then larger. You could, I mean, that's, I'm just throwing it out there for consideration because I see this as like, whoa, it's a so lot to take at once. With this, you, as far as if you made a change to whatever it is, it isn't going to make it any different with the USDA guidelines. Right now, we meet and or exceed all the USDA guidelines. You can change to organics. You can do whatever you want. Scratch cooking. It won't change. It won't make you any more, any more um, compliant. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 we are there already. Um, you're working on the quality is what you're looking for here, um, and in some ways it'll be even more challenging to get to the USDA guidelines. Um, there's things now with what we do that are there. If we go and split components apart to try to do whole meat type of stuff instead of some of the processed meats, because I know that's a Topic that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. The way the stuff, the USDA stuff we get from Claudia now, it meets the components. To do it from scratch, it's going to be several components to get to that same qualification. Um, it's not, it's easy to do. I mean, we do it at home, we cook it, but it will change the whole makeup of how that plate looks. 
And you sort of asked why it wasn't a success earlier. Mm -hmm. I've done this for 17 years. The one thing I've seen is there's six of you in front of me right now. If you each brought a recipe into <laughs> lasagna that you do every day, they would all be different. When we do scratch cooking in almost any district, we see our counts go down in those days. Because I'm just using lasagna as an example, but my lasagna doesn't taste like mom's. And a kid, first, second, third grade kid, may try it once, but if it doesn't taste like mom's, they won't use it. And I see it with your district when we do scratch cooking, and I see it with the other 15 mm -hmm. districts I oversee. Scratch cooking days are one of our, except for turkey gravy day. But <laughs> <laughs> go figure. But typically when we do a casserole type thing, or even a pasta dish, or stir fries even, if it doesn't taste like mom's, we, we're not successful with it. And it's not like we can keep rewriting the recipe every time to find that, because since I get you liking it, you don't like it. Right. And I've got districts where if one likes it spicy in this school, the other end of the district, they don't care for it when we make it that way. So if, even in a district, we can see a wide range of taste and, and palates, mm -hmm. and it's hard to fit that and make kids want to eat. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the capital improvements, too, you said there's, there's some hit on scale. Like if you did it across the board, scale might be you, advantageous you on, discount. on yeah. pricing. But yes, you get some discount. I mean, can you give me and a ballpark of what? that's not in this. Yeah. Um, 10 to 15 percent or more. Okay. And that's not in this. I, you know, I really don't know until you put it out to bid. Um, but there's, and we can mix and match the equipment to how we want. Um, some of it's going to be the retrofitting um, to put the tilt skillets in that we mentioned. You have to have suppression pits. Two or three year schools don't have suppression pits. They can go in fairly easily, or they can be very, very expensive to put in. It all depends on how the building is and the ducts and everything else. So it's, this was a best estimate and I was hopefully going high, mm -hmm. but I, there's no, Good. I can't give you a guarantee on it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just want to... I have, I have a couple of comments and questions. Go ahead. Um, just a point of clarification, what I think I heard you say, John, was that because right now we are meeting or exceeding USDA guidelines, changing our food at the end of the day, the calorie count, the sodium, the fat, and the other nutritional um, I, you know, pieces would essentially all be the same as what we're currently doing. Is that correct? Pretty much. I mean, from scratch, you might, you know, some of those topics you might, you know, fat, some of that we might be able to tweak a little bit, bring it down a little bit, whatever there. Calories, we have a range we have to stay in. So we will have to meet that range of calories not to exceed or go under. Um, those are probably the big two, uh, the, the fat content, saturated fats, and the calories. Salt content is the other one. Um, and that's the other piece that's hard right now, is giving food flavor without the salt. Um, and the restrictions are even getting tighter. If everything stays the course, we've got one or, two more year, two, one or two more years of restrictions coming out with the sodium side. So again, okay. there's, there's a challenge in that. And it doesn't matter whether we cook it from scratch or if we're doing what we're doing now. Uh, my next question is, uh, after the in initial capital investment, um, it looks like the sustained cost would be an additional $386,000 per year for food and uh, salaries to prepare the food. Is that the correct assessment? That, from your that's, here? Yes, that's correct how I put that together. And that left that culinary person on the, on the books if we still chose to go after that. Um, if you took them off, I can't remember, it was 60000 or something like that, depending. Um, but the other hourly they would still all stay there <laughs> and keep increasing with health care costs and everything else that we have going on, so that keeps going. So that would be equivalent to 156% increase in our food service costs, is what that would be um, for yeah. our right. annual cost. Yeah, approximately and on that then, second uh, year. Yeah. And then my next, the next question is um, related to... I lost my train of thought because I wrote this all, I didn't write this down as I was thinking of the question. Um, oh, so when we look at the capital investment to uh, go back and retrofit these kitchens, you know, some of these kitchens are actually brand new or very new. I think Haley was just mm -hmm. redone, what, two years ago? So we would essentially be going back and ripping out kitchens that are almost new in some places. Do we have ages of the various kitchens? No. We're this, when I say 
when we're doing this, this is placing equipment in the kitchen. It's not tearing things out. The only ones that may be affected are ones that don't have suppression hoods. The, like for Haley, for example, we just need to, to make it equal to the other kitchens, we would need to add a tilt skillet and a two burner stove, which one of those at least could fit under the current hood. Um, okay. So this it, it isn't retrofitting, we're not talking about demolishing, starting over, it's adding to the current equipment. The middle school, okay. high school, they've got spots already to stick stuff under the hoods. We just need to place a piece of equipment there. There okay. may be some wiring, plumbing, but it's, it, these are, this isn't a remodel. It's adding equipment to the current facilities. Do these cost estimates include the addition of the wiring or other utilities? That's that why the street value high. And then there's the miscellaneous in there to try to capture some of that. But again, some of this stuff, Hemingway sticks in my mind. Um, to junior high, sometimes we're blowing breakers over there. So to add more equipment, I don't know what that means. So some of these buildings, it could be new box, electrical boxes or something to try to, try to accommodate this stuff. So it, that's a stab in the dark. I don't know your buildings that well. Oh, Kathy, Schmiel. are you done? Is that, are you done, Kathy? Yes, I am. Thank okay. You. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this, um, the implementation piece and the, the education piece and the sustainability and the things that are, uh, you know, I, I describe them as values. People come to your school because of your academic program, but they also come because they share the same values. And we have different groups in our community that have nobody's the same here, especially. This has got the most diversity of any county of its size I can imagine. So there's, there are values <coughs> that are that in different pockets in this community, people want to holistically include this as a piece of their kids' whole child education. And it seems like that is, for, for whatever reason, that is the piece that maybe is, is not your specialty, although you probably try. I'm just thinking, I can't imagine, you know, I'm looking at the situation that happened. I think that we need to open up our minds and say, how can this be integrated just the way that a leader in me or dual immersion or something like that was intro introduced in various pockets in the community. So I think that, um, I guess what I'm getting at is that we need a more comprehensive view of how this would be implemented. And possibly that's not what happened last time. And that's what I want to get uncovered before we go down this road. The other thing is that the, the levy, um, we still have money in the levy. And in the, the lead up to the, le to the strategic plan last time, I'm looking at you, Rob, because you might not um, know this, there were dozens and dozens of comments about wanting more um, sustainable food in school, organic food in school, gardens in school. So we're, this is a need that was not addressed last time, and yet we still have money left over from that 16 million, something like that. I don't know, 10 million. We have a sub substantial amount. Um, and this would, to me, check that box of what did people want. I don't, I share your concerns about throwing it at all the schools at once with one provider. I would strongly think that that wouldn't be the way to go. Uh, but I, but I want to open, if, if we're there, it's successful, absolutely. I, I have a, a comment I'd like to make. Um, I do see how we do differentiate from school to school, but that's also been a, a chilly peel of our district. Um, you know, we recently just addressed uh, the gate issue with the disparity between one school's offering to another. And so, you know, if we're going to look at doing this incrementally with the full plan of doing it district-wide, that's one thing, but if we're looking at just doing it in pockets and not giving those opportunities to other people, I think that creates a disparity that could be discriminating from one building to the next. Um, so I would not be in favor of that. And I think that before we even address the question and go down the what if, I think the biggest point of discussion is 
is this something the board wants to do for almost four hundred thousand dollars a year? Even ask, I mean, setting aside the initial investment, this is an incremental cost to our budget. When you're providing the same nutritional content to the students at the end of the day, and so is this the best way we can serve our students, affecting their whole child experience, their student achievement? You know, is this really improving their experience at school? Or is that $400,000 a year going to be better suited in a classroom would be what I think would be a bigger picture, 30,000 foot conversation that we should look at before we get into some pretty significant details. Dr. Holmes. And I would want a recommendation from our administration about that, especially when we're talking about, <laughs> you know, potential scout salary schedule issues. It's going to have an instant across to us um, as we look at the budget this year. We've heard from our auditors that in the next two to three years, we might be having to go out for a supplemental levy. And if, if that's for a real possibility, and we're saying we're going to spend $400,000 more to change the way, the type of food that we're delivering, but at the end of the day, it's still the same number of calories, fat, protein, all the other stuff, is that really what we want? And is that really what's going to affect students and increase? you know, their experience in our school and that achievement and, you know, have that in the classroom effect. And so that's the way I would like to see this conversation go, is kind of pulling back from those details and looking at it from a bigger perspective. Dr. Holmes. Um, I just had a question, first of all, because I'm wearing the hat of, okay, if this is something we want to do, how do we make this go forward? Um, and it's not the retrofitting that's that is, I think, the prohibitive part. The prohibitive part is the ongoing costs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to figure out what really what that number is. And right now we um, underwrite our food, or our lunch program by $247,000 over and above what we bring in either from uh, student fees or from reimbursements from the feds. Um, and you're saying that in, once this is all established and in place, it's going to take another 386,000 on top of the 247, so that's getting close to 600,000 a year in additional costs. Right. So if if the, this is the will of the board to do this, as the administration, I would like to know where you would like to take that money. You know, what would be the what would we swap for that? Uh, we're going to be talking later tonight, or you're going to be talking later tonight about our um, current uh, policy in regards to alcohol and other substance abuse issues. Um, you're aware that we're working on putting together a program next year to provide intervention for these kids. So already I'm looking in the budget because we're trying to keep the budget flat uh, and no, not add any more FTE. What do we take away to be able to add this? So I need some guidance on that. And I would agree that if this is something you want to do, that we do develop a plan for um, not um, overnight, but over uh, a shorter period of time implementing this across the district because I um, feel like I'm in the process right now trying to undo some disparities that are across the district. Don't want to add another one to the list to have to undo later. Uh, mm -hmm. That one school gets home cooking. I like that better than scratch cooking. Sounds better to me. Uh, one school gets home cooking and another school doesn't, you know, type of thing. So. I would tend to agree with comments about the disparity <laughs> across the district. I think we need to try and keep the le playing field as level as we can. Um, and I would agree that uh, adding another 386000 of supplement to already 247000 is a is a huge investment over the next duration of of the district. It's not a one time. It's 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 going to expand and and grow on top of that. And that concerns me with already one of the highest budgets in the state of how do we toe the line, but yet um, really offer our students the the best food possible, but the best educational experience possible, preparing them for their for their college or their career and their future. So uh, I would struggle, as it stands right now, where to come up with that extra $386,000. John? Some, if I might add, just sort of to your topic about 
the, the people wanting to have the better food and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I might be quoting the wrong committee here, but it was last spring I sat in with a food coalition meeting. And we went through a lot of the stuff we're talking about here, doing a whole meat type of thing, rather processed, organics, et cetera. Um, when it's all got said and done, I asked a question point blank. If we did this, would your kids eat with us? And they told me no. All right, these were people that are on that. So well, I, would, I would urge you, if you're going to do this, to try to get a focus group or focus groups or somebody to commit to this because we, you could do all this. And you might, let's say, go about 10 kids. That isn't going to cover this in any way. <laughs> you, need, you need the big lamb. And given the district, I, don't, I have districts where it's called provision two. Kids eat for free, everybody. And we only feed 85% of the kids in the district. The other 15% just, for whatever reason, don't want to eat with us. They're high school kids. They go off and do their thing. Some of the elementary kids, they have their allergies. Some parents take care of the allergies. Or they just don't eat that. Meaning, my spaghetti doesn't taste like mom's. I'm not going to eat spaghetti. So they, mom sends them a lunch. That goes on. So I'm not sure what the big bang you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, district with your demographics. Um, it's going to be a tough challenge because mm -hmm. the paid market is the hardest one to get to and that's that's the hard part where we battle with all of my districts right now is trying to get the paid kids to eat with us. To me, rather than trying to justify the additional $386,000, I would like to see us focus more on how to make our current offerings. We have an excellent fruit and salad bar that the kids have the opportunity to take, but as we've all talked about in the past, give a give an eight-year-old an apple with no teeth, how are they going to eat it? I'd like to see us focus more on, on making some of those offerings um, more presentable, more kid-friendly to be able to partake of those nutrients of, rather than jump in whole head on, yeah, on something of this nature. That's something we talked about a little bit actually Delaney and I today. It creates a little challenge for us, but it can be accomplished. There's a little bit more waste factor in that mm -hmm. because they have to take a certain size portion. Great. So doing stuff like you're talking, we dice all the apples up, they turn brown as you know. Mm -hmm. You have to room at the end of the day. So we have to guess how many kids are going to eat. There may be more waste because it's got to be thrown away at the end of the Understood. day. But that's a min minor cost compared to what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, saying this is where we'd like to go, we can do that. And it's a small cost, but you would be able to have you know, a little bit of labor or whatever, dice up the stuff, make it easier for a kid, to, more palatable for them. And that's stuff we've talked about and we can't do, just accepting that that small amount of extra expense with doing that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Graves. Well, I think, you know, this is our first touch on this. You know, this is the first time we've seen this. I don't think we, you know, we're not making any decisions tonight. We're taking this all in. We're, we're <coughs> you know, looking at these numbers. And we've been given this, this gold star set up with fancy kitchens with all the best equipment and all organic food and a big price tag, but it seems to be that we can think on this a little bit. This, is, this would be a big move. Or if we want to come back and ask, you know, okay, can you give us the, the silver and the bronze? And what would be some, some smaller things that we, what can, I, you know, I don't even know because I'm one that has to think about things for a little while. We, we do know from the strategic plan five years ago from our surveys last year, you know, to all the schools that they would like to see some different food offerings. And uh, so I think that's something we know as a board uh, that our community wants. We're also doing our strategic plan where we're going to get some information back. So, I mean, I myself, before kind of going down that road, would just like to sort of sit on this for a little bit and maybe have some other, you know, discussions about some other possible plans that wouldn't put the, you know, the biggest burden on our budget. So that's, that's how I feel. Trustee Schwartel. Great. So, so I just, um, you know, I think that it's, it's, there's a different view of what this issue is amongst our various members of the board. Some see it as just better food, um, ramping up what we have just a little bit. Other, I mean, I see it as partially that and partially an issue of the values of the community. And when I, or a portion of this community, 
and I think the whole community, but on the scale of wants and needs, it's, you know, it's pretty different for different groups depending on socioeconomic background, all kinds of things. But I look at other school districts that we are competing with, whether it's the, in terms of attracting people to this community, the mindset of many people who are here. I look at the Boulders. I look at the Aspens. They have amazing holistic natural food service programs. It is integrated into their schools. It's integrated into their mindset. I would also point out that these school districts have very few independent schools. They're, they are doing a very good job with all of the kids in their valley or in, their, in, in, their, in the place that they live. People like the product that they're serving. So I think we can be penny wise and pound foolish with this. We can, sure, we can look at 350 whatever thousand, which by the way is a half of a percent of our expenditures. Half of a percent. It's it, putting that in perspective. If you think that, I, I agree totally with uh, Dr. Holmes, you can't m pull that money out of thin air. I, I understand that. <coughs> the, the flip side of that is we, have, we are down 250, well, let's put it this way, 250 kids have made other choices in the last five years in this district for, for their education. And I feel like we need to look at it and say, what are these people getting? in common. And when I look at it, I think I see, I see some themes. I see a, an outdoor component. I see a nutrition, a sustainability. I see this kind of mindset. And they all have it in common. So I think that we need to really look at our school district in terms of serving all the people in the valley and making sure that, we're, that our ownership gap, that people in this community are not making other choices, leaving us with at the end of the day, less voters that will pay for a levy. And that, that concerns me greatly. It, concerns, it should concern every teacher. It con should concern, you know, at any rate. So that's, that's, and I, yeah, I'll shut up. Oh, there's one, there's one <laughs> quick other, there's one quick other um, part to this, which I didn't understand until I watched this movie, Fed Up, which I know you've seen. Back in the 80s, the government, we had all scratch kitchens. Well, actually, late 70s. Reagan came in, slashed, and I remember because I was working for a congressman on the Hill, I remember that budget landing on the, on the door, it literally made a thump. They slashed the school budget hugely, and you guys know, probably know this. A lot of privatization took place, um, and all the kitchens were ripped out, or the stoves, and all the scratch cooking was ripped out, most of it. So now we're clawing back to a level of funding that we used to have, that served our kids very well for a lot of years. And I'll point out the time after the scratch cooking, the scratch kitchens were, were ripped out is when obesity started. I think that there's, you know, when Pepsi comes in, um, you know, so at any rate. So I think we're going back to a level percentage-wise probably of, of, of what used to be when I was growing up. So anyway. Okay. I think we've had a, a good discussion amongst the board. And it's a discussion that can can continue in the future, and uh, we'll have some budget implications that need to be figured out on decisions for, for the future. So. Thanks for doing the work. Appreciate yep. it. Thank you very much. With that, I'll have to turn the time over to Catherine Graves to run the next portion of the meeting, if that's okay. I must recuse myself um, for this next topic of gifting the portable building to the Cary oh, Library Board. That because my mother-in-law is employed by the Cary Library. Okay, so I am going to, do we? Can you let me just take it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I Carol has submitted a, report a proposal on to the uh, board uh, for um, getting rid of the unused modular building that is sitting on blocks and boarded up at Cary School. Um, I hadn't been here too long when I was told we owned that, and I was embarrassed uh, that we had that piece. And, that w and by the way, I'll, t I'll just give you a heads up right now that we have another piece that I'm embarrassed we owned, and so as soon as I can figure out what to do with that <laughs> thing, we'll take care of that one too. Because uh, having moved here from the East Coast, I don't want to be accused of being a slum landlord by having boarded up buildings. Um, so uh, in this particular instance, this modular building was used um, during the uh, renovations that were done at Cary and has been sitting there unused since. 
um, and deteriorating since. And we've had uh, some folks look at it about what is the estimated value of the building. If we were to sell this at auction, we would have to sell it for its value, and that is a, a pretty high risk. We don't think that would probably happen. However, we do have some folks who could use it, and that is the Cary Library, which sits next door to the school and um, provides summer programming <clears throat> to the students there at Cary in reading. And so our, my recommendation is to gift them with this um, portable building, give them 18 months to raise the funds that they will need to be able to move the modular building onto a foundation and make it part of their library. And if in 18 months they can't accomplish this, then we'll be looking again for how do we get rid of this um, piece of property that's not being used and is deteriorating. And I, um, is Julie here? I haven't seen Julie. She's not, but I'm here. Oh, all right. Are, are you Cassie? I am. Okay. Uh, Cassie O'Crawley from the Cary Library Board, if you have any questions um, about what they would do with this. Um, it's just on the agenda tonight for information, and next month we'll be there for action. So, any questions? Uh, or Mr. Royal can speak to any of the condition of the building. I'm just curious how much needs to be raised to move it <laughs> and to set it up. Understandable. Do it still have tires on it? <laughs> Do we know? It was somewhat, it was built in place. Oh, so it's built. It's, it's an actual structure. Oh, okay, so it does, it's not a true portable end. Yeah. yeah. I don't have much. Like I mean, it seems sounds like, like a nice thing to do. Sounds like it I makes mean, sense. Are we it, using it? It comes back no. to us and we it's put it totally up for sale. Totally unused by us. Totally and unused. For how by long us. has it been unused? Uh, since 2012. So it's been vacant for two years, mm -hmm. going on three. Two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So. And the pigeons live there yet? I mean, is it, I'm pigeons? sure there's stuff in it. I haven't yeah. gone in it, but it is sitting in the middle. Somebody of the, should use it. It's <laughs> sitting in the middle of the field, <laughs> boarded up on blocks. And I was wanting the church there by it to clean it up, and then I found out it was ours. <laughs> <laughs> so do you foresee any use for it in the Blaine County School District in no. the near future? If we, had, if, if, if we tried to bring it over here to use it here, it would cost us as much as building it here. And then some right, problems. it's a lot. To, it's like yeah. $50,000, $60,000 to transport, to move it isn't would it? Be, yeah. It'd like be that. an interesting adventure, but it would cost us a lot. So. Okay. All right. So um, I would encourage the library to be creative in the methods of moving the building and be most cost effective in your approach. <laughs> so, all right, so we'll bring it back to you for action next time. And those of you that know the other ugly piece of property we own, if you have any <laughs> ideas, let me know. I've had one already. Tear it down and, and build a tree. <laughs> um, we <laughs> actually own the boarded up building that sits um, on Croy on the south side of Atkinson's over here. I'll go take a look at that. And it is very small, so, uh, and it's not, it's not, can't be inhabited by people anymore because it doesn't meet standards for earthquakes and there's no place to put snow, there's no parking. Um, you might be right, plant a tree. Plant a tree. <laughs> yeah, John. Isn't that amazing? Oh, is that, that so? I heard that. It's like a closet. So it really should become a museum. <laughs> yeah. All right. We only have two ideas for that. <laughs> All right. I believe that discussion is over, so I'll join the conversation again. So we will move on to the Blaine County School District Policy 507.3 discussion. And just as a reminder, that is... Um, our drug, alcohol, tobacco, and other prohibited substances policy. And um, in your packets board is a memo from uh, Dr. Holmes about this. And I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you if you have anything to say. Um, the memo is not about the policy. It's okay. just a memo about an update because all of you are aware that we have a committee that is working on trying to 
uh, build a stronger prevention program at the high school and middle school level, and then an intervention program for our kids who do uh, have issues either around substances abuse or mental health so that we can intervene and still help them to graduate. And um, so that's just an update on that. And we have uh, secondary administrators in the room that are anxious to hear your discussion so you can, they can take yeah. what they learned from you tonight and continue their work on developing an intervention program for next year. I think one of the things that I, I struggle with the, the most um, is as a student discipline comes to, to us as a board on the, re the reason we all joined the board is because we care about students, because, because we care about their success in the future, their education. And how do you hold accountable to a policy but yet try and do the best you can for each individual student while protecting the good of the whole? Um, and, that, and that's something that I felt that the board has has been struggling with the past little bit as far as how can we prevent? Make sure they don't get to us in the first place. But yet, if they do, how can we help these students? Because a lot of the students that, that come to us, um, let's face it, we're not a, a one-strike-and-you're-out board. Um, we're not a one-and-done district at all. Um, it's been multiple offenses before it comes to us, and, and how do we intervene and help these students um, get the assistance that they need in order to overcome some of these addictions at times? Um, and, and that's something that, that I feel we're struggling with. And I'll go ahead and open it up for conversation. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that you said. Um, I appreciate all of the work that you've done in bringing that committee together. And it's, it's my understanding that you and a committee are looking at our 507.3 policy and working on uh, some revisions to the first offense. Um, the committee will bring forth recommendations to the policy committee on how to revise that policy. Okay. Um, and do, you know, should there be uh, steps in between first offense and second offense as it stands right now and different l uh, levels of intervention uh, before they mm -hmm. come to you? Do they, you know, um, and how do we set up some of the uh, plans that put kids uh, on notice that this is <coughs> not acceptable but also um, put kids on notice that we're going to be right beside them as they crawl out of this trouble they've gotten themselves right. into? Mm -hmm. Um, I also have been looking at this policy these last couple of months and looking at the first offense, the second offense, the third offense, and um, a first offense on distribution. Another, on distribution. And I would like to, I guess, give, because there were some recommendations that I wanted to make in revisions <laughs> myself and put it to the policy committee. And uh, Dr. Holmes said that this committee was happening. Uh, so as to bring up some of these thoughts at the board meeting and maybe give some guidance so there isn't two revisions going to the policy committee, there's, there's one revision. So I have some thoughts. I don't know if I should come, if I should share some of these. I'll share some of them with the board. And I guess part of it is to give a little more flexibility to the Board of Trustees when we are in our hearings. We have some, some absolutes here. Um, third offense, the student will be suspended with a recommendation of the Board of Trustees for an expulsion of one school year. I would like to see an up to one school year. It just, you never know what the situation is. All situations are different. It could be that a student is, you know, suspended or supposed to be expelled in October and we want to have them start school in September. So that wouldn't be a one full school year. That's just a, an example of where some of that flexibility would, uh, would be nice for us to have. 
Uh, in the second offense, there's a couple up twos in there when it says one full calendar year. Uh, the, al the other thing that I would like to, there's also, um, we still have our, our trimesters in here, and we have, <laughs> we have carry at trimesters, we have the high school at semesters where most of these expulsions are happening and suspensions, and we could just take that out. You know, we could just take out uh, you know, the trimester in there. So I feel like there's a little bit of cleaning up in there that we could do. And the other thing that I, this is, you know, just coming from me, I haven't really talked to the other board members about this. I would like to see somewhere in these offenses, we use the alternative setting centers quite often in our expulsions, but we do not have that mentioned in here. And it doesn't have to necessarily be alternative setting center. It could be, uh, using an alternate educational model, you know, something like that. And that also gives us, us a little, oh, it's right here. Um, you know, it could be after it says uh, agree to do what the drug and alcohol assessment does and follow the recommendations of the agency. And this may, expulsion may also include an alternate educational model, you know, something like that. So just some, just some, those are my. Are we some? Pardon? I'm wondering how you see the process going with the policy committee. Uh, whether there's a, a task force mm -hmm. that brings suggestions for the policy committee, or if the policy committee does have ad hoc members on the policy committee itself, and then brings recommendations back to the board. I think the, these recommendations were for our board to discuss mm -hmm. for tonight. Okay and that they would go to this task force committee because they're, the one, they're rewriting that first offense and, and sort of changing some of this 507.3. Mm -hmm. So instead of the board putting some revisions and the task force putting revisions, it's, it's the task force doing everything. And it comes to the policy committee and then possibly some ad hoc members coming to the policy committee when, when you guys get the the final copy, yeah. the revision. I, I want to clarify that the the committee or the task force, whatever we're calling it, that's working on it, is not working on writing the policy. There, because I, I don't want oh, uh, Mr. McGee that. to fall off of the chair back there. Because <laughs> it's like now, what am I doing? <laughs> I misunderstood. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're working on developing the program or the intervention, and so then they'll come back and say, "Here's what we developed," and so. At the first offense, we would suggest your policy say blah, blah, blah. And here at the second offense, because they now got the program, so there's something to actually do with these students that are in this situation. And then that would make the recommendations um, to the policy committee of what, how to change the policy. Um, but no, Dan, you don't have to rewrite the policy. You just have to get the program and then come back to us, and then we'll make it, the policy fit with the new program. And tie it to, tie it to yeah. intervention, right? Right. Like, that's the proposals we, we're lacking on the intervention. Side right, right. As a district right now. Because you can change the policy tonight. It's not going to change what happens to the kids because we just don't have an intervention program right now. Right. Yeah. We need to talk about the net, right? Because when you cut them, there's got to be some kind of net. Right. Yep. And we need to make probably the language of the cutting maybe a little less ruthless, but still hard and fast. But... There's got to be a catch. Mm -hmm. Trustee Baker. Um, well, I just wanted to comment that, um, and I think I said this one other time in another meeting that we had, I do think it would be very important once the um, portion that you're working on, Gwen Carroll, uh -huh. uh, regarding the program, the intervention. Yes, the intervention, exactly. Once that's developed and we start looking at revising the policy, uh, you know, Mr. Blackman talked about um, a task force that's going to look at that similar like what we did with the wellness policy and is that a possibility? And I would strongly encourage that we establish that and that that task force be comprised of experts who understand teen substance abuse and also the ramifications of those behaviors. And you know, we talked about, you know, having probation involved, having the drug coalition experts. 
which involves social workers who are, you know, experts in dealing with teen substance abuse and getting their recommendations on what that policy should look like, and then then doing what what Captain uh, Trustee Graves suggested and follow, following our own policy rules and that we just adopted that that task force would then report us to the policy committee. So it, to me it seems like a, this is going to be a three-step process. Mm -hmm. What you're doing currently, Superintendent uh, Holmes, mm -hmm. the task force that would look at changing the language to match what the new culture and the new environment and the new resources that we have in our district, as well as making recommendations of what that policy could look like. Um, if I could just interject here. I think the um, many of the folks that have been advising us as we work on trying to develop this program are from juvenile probation, drug coalition stuff. So they could just move over. We could ask them to continue with us, but now move over from creating the intervention to helping advise the policy committee on how to do this. Um, we do anticipate bringing you uh, some kind of um, document on what we anticipate the program will be in March because we'll have to have it done by then to be able to figure out how much money we're looking for in the budget. Trustee Schwartel. So, um, so I would really like to, in the meantime, because this is quite the process going back and forth and, and different groups, to give us the flexibility so that we're not locked into something that we it just doesn't seem right for the situation to, to put the words in of up to um, one full calendar year and of up to in the second offense and the third offense so that we are not, kids are not coming through when and we're, we're on task forces and we can only, we only have one option. So that's my, I would like to be able to do that right now. There's three places up to one year, grade level, level it, three places, and second offense, third offense, and then grade levels K through 12, first offense. For distribution. The, yeah, exactly. And it's a real easy fix, and I think it does what we need it to do, and yet we're passing off for the details to the appropriate committees and things like that. <clears throat> My fear is revising it twice, and where it's just a dis discussion, I believe our administrators have kind of heard where we're coming from and have been able to take a straw poll vote on, on kind of where we as a board s sit on some of these topics and that will most likely influence um, some of the recommendations as they come to us in the future. But as it stands right now, this is set um, for discussion only and it's not on the okay. um, action or decision portion of the agenda. So I don't believe that we can legally move it there tonight okay. in order to do that. Um, uh, I have a comment. Yeah, j just, okay. Yep, and then I'll, I have one other okay. question. That we recently just adopted a policy on development of policy, <laughs> and I do think it's important for the board to follow its policies on this, and I think that taking that action without going through the steps that we just approved ourselves for how these things are done would not be advisable. Yeah, I... I just wanted to say I weigh that, you know, against um, us n not getting to it before the, the next kid comes down the, the it sits in front of us. To me, that's 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 the thing that I care about most um, is that kid. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to make the board clear: uh, it's obviously we want to follow our policy. It's not doesn't set a good precedent to go against your policy. However, you can do it. I called up the ISBA and they said yes, you can do it. You should be trying to change your policy, but we can vote against our policy. So that would be the stopgap if we're not able to change it tonight and we really feel that there's a case that comes up that doesn't warrant something on there for whatever reason before the staff and, and has a chance to get to it. Okay. All right. With that, um, if there's no further comments on the 5073 discussion, We'll go ahead and move with the Blaine County School District policies for review that have gone through the policy committee. And Mr. Blackman, are you presenting for that? The policy for the the policies for review? Yeah, for the policies that, yeah, 203.7, 206.1, 206.2, 206.3, 206.4, 206.5, 206.6, 206.7, 206.8, 206.9, 206.10, 206.11, 206.12, 206.13, 206.14, 206.15, 206.16, 206.17, 206.18, 
okay. Hold on, let me get these up. <laughs> well, it's a mouthful. Most of the ones in front of you, you'll see that they're, they're marked new or legally referenced. Uh, some of these should have been marked in both places where they're actually new and they are legally referenced or, or uh, clerical uh, revisions. Um, I did mark a couple of them in both spots. These are um, coming from, to us from Everhart and Mackey as a, as a direct result of um, legislation. Um, you have one in front of you uh, regarding questionable health. That went through the, that went through the um, policy committee. And that one was actually, um, that one was actually drafted originally by Amy White, um, personnel attorney uh, in Boise that works for the ISBA for you guys. So. These are first touch. These are for your review. We're not asking for any action at this point. This would be for action for the next scheduled board meeting. So these are for your touch. These have also been sent to the policy committee in case they have concerns reading through this. They have some time to, to do so. Um, this is our first um, go around using the new forms. Trustee um, Graves. I personally love this new form that's the cover letter for all the policies. I don't know if you guys know about this, but it's a whole form that says if it's a new policy, if it's a revised policy, it's a legally referenced policy, a clerical revision. It tells who submits it. It tells the reasons for the revisions. It's, <coughs> it's really great. Um, so thank you, Liz. And <laughs> Everyone else that worked on that, uh, Kathy. Um, I do have some um, some comments on policy 206.4. I don't have that one in, in front of me. It's yeah, it's this yeah. Keep going. Okay. Record retention. Yep. Personnel files, records retention, and I I realize uh, it's the last one. It's the longest one. It starts out with personnel, but yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. So I was reading through all of these, and it, I, it feels like they need to, I know they came from Eberhardt and Mackey, but it feels like they need to be edited mm -hmm. again and kind of gone through with a, a fine-tooth comb. Um, like the last line of the first paragraph, all files connected with an employee are considered strictly confidential and access will be limited only to those who have a job related need to know the information. That's what I don't understand that. Who have a job related need to know the information. Such as the HR director or direct supervisor. Yeah. Um, those are confidential records to the personnel themselves. Uh, we, we wouldn't make those records available to anybody that didn't have a direct job related need to know that information that's not shareable with you know anybody um, other than the employee themselves and and a direct supervisor if it's applicable a lot right. of times medical records things like that are right protected I understand it well how you're saying it but it to me that just didn't resonate yeah it just didn't make sense to me I don't know maybe somebody could look that's at that as it say, is probably pretty okay Okay. Um, uh. Again, this is a first touch. So if there are things that are concerning to you in the mm -hmm. language, um, then I would love to have you highlight it and bring it back to me. And, and uh, Okay, that would be better, you. I yeah. think, than going through this. Sure. I have a few other ones. So, okay. I'm just curious on, like, the record retention recommendations, like, is there a big variance there, or are those like... There are, there are some. The problem is whatever you have in policy is what you're held to. Yeah. So there are state minimums, um, but one of the requirements of the state is that you do have a retention schedule. Sure. So you can't destroy records if you don't have a retention schedule. You're committed to keep them forever. I don't know if you've seen our records room, but it's now over in maintenance and taking up quite a bit of their space. Well, there's so what we can do with that building over in the... <laughs> So um, there, there's a lot of things that are 
that you need to consider on how you store records, what you store after certain points. There are pieces of the personnel records that are um, that you do keep forever. There are other yeah. pieces that you can purge. Um, a lot of times we can reduce the style, size of a file down considerably. Um, 31 years in the district, mine's about two and a half inches thick. You could get that down to about you know a half an inch if. Um, <laughs> you get rid of what you don't have to keep and you have a schedule in which to do that by. But you do have to abide by your schedule. Yeah, I am not a hoarder, so I was just curious. <laughs> did you sh shorten these down or what? And we don't want to be either. Yeah, <laughs> I can fully appreciate that. But we do want to keep what's essential. All right. Are there any other questions, comments from the board on this first touch for the policies for review? All right. We'll go ahead and open it up for public comment if there is any on things that have been discussed up to this point before we move into the decision portion of the meeting. Seeing none, uh, do I hear, well, <coughs> under decisions, we, first item of business would be the consent agenda, which we have the consider consideration of minutes, the regular November board meeting, November 11th, 2014, special meeting of the board, December 5th, 2014, regular December <coughs> meeting of the board, December 9th, 2014, special meeting of the board, December 10th, 2014, special meeting of the board, December 15th, 2014, special meeting of the board, December 17th, 2014, special meeting of the board, January 6th, 2015. An application for study travel by a student group with Mr. Max Stymack. Uh, Wood River High School music teacher and board in your packets. There is a correction on the dates in there for that application. Um, three, consideration of student teaching contract for Teresa Arutia, Master of Education and Special Education under the direction of Christina Delaney, Hemingway Elementary School. Acceptance of monthly financial reports, payment of bills. Consideration of personnel exiting and entering. Lori, would you mind sharing those? It's a short list. Under certified professional staff exiting, Polly McQueen. This is a retirement effective uh, 831 15. She is our speech pathologist at Hemingway Elementary School. And classified staff recommending for hire, Nicole Williams, administrative assistant in finance department at the district office. All right. Do I hear a motion to accept the consent agenda as read? I'll make that motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> and we have the consideration of recommendation to <clears throat> RFQ for insurance broker. Do I hear a motion to approve staff of sending out for RFQs for insurance? I'll make that motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mike, would you please take care of that? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And item C has been amended to come back to us next month. So we will go ahead. That concludes the decision portion of the meeting and we'll move on to the any items board deems necessary at this time. All right. So it looks like we have a few things scheduled already for our next couple of meetings. We have um, course additions, deletions, recommendations coming back to us. We also have um, all of the um, board policies for review coming back to us under this decision portion next month, as well as we have a busy upcoming month and an exciting time with our strategic planning process well underway. So thank you once again. We'd like to just encourage everybody to attend that uh, strategic planning process. Uh, meetings coming up the next few days um, in Cary on the 21st. Mm -hmm. And at uh, 
Ketchum YMCA at noon on Thursday, as well as at 6 at the community campus on Thursday. So please come out and share your ideas with us and brainstorm with us. And with that, I'll go ahead and call for adjournment. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting, Aye. A, meeting adjourned at 8.15. It seems like a long break. Not in meeting. a bad way, but it seems like yeah, we'll have to go back in. We're we'll getting drink. Yeah, yeah. It was, a big, it was a big thing. We have some food in here, too. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly.